Welcome to the May seminar of the Conference on Reproducibility and Replicability in Economics and Social Sciences, hosted at the Canadian Economics Association. Thank you for joining us. Um, the Conference on Reproducibility and Replicability in Economics and the Social Sciences is a series of discussions by specialists and practitioners on the topics of reproducibility, replicability, and transparency. This is the ninth session. If you missed any of the previous sessions, we've posted them on YouTube. The link is on our website. Our panels discuss educational and procedural barriers slowing down adoption, whether journals or institutions or funders should be the verifiers of reproducibility, whether and how scientists' work can be made to be reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at the inception and data collection stage and implications for the training of undergraduate and graduate students. My name is Marie Connolly, and I'm today's moderator, member of the organizing committee of CRESS, along with Ian Schmuth, and the PIs of this project, Lars Villuber, who's here today, and Alexander Michuda. I am also the data editor of the Kane Journal of Economics, the vice dean of research at uh, GUCAM, and the topic we are discussing today is important to me as a researcher, as a vice dean of research, and as an applicant to funds at SHRC and other funding agencies. Before we start, for those of you not familiar with the terms and context of reproducibility, in this webinar series, we focus on computational reproducibility, the ability to regenerate the figures and tables in a paper with the same code, and especially important in today's session, the same and possibly confidential data. Open data is the idea that data should be accessible to many in the simplest possible fashion in order to enable reproducibility, replica replicability, and simply other uses of the data for research. But what happens when the data are confidential? How does that affect reproducibility? And how can confidential data be made more open? Today, we are joined by three panelists. Kimberly McGrail is a professor at the University of British Columbia School of Population and Public Health and scientific director of Population Data BC and Health Data Research Network Canada. Her research interests are quantitative policy evaluations and all aspects of population data science. She's currently a Canadian representative with the Global Partnership for AI as part of the Data Governments Working Group and was a member of the Expert Advisory Group for the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy. Martin Taylor recently completed a seven-year term as Executive Director of the Canadian Research Data Centre Network from 2016 to 2023. He is Professor Emeritus of Geography at the University of Victoria and Adjunct Professor in the School of Geography and Earth Sciences at McMaster University. He served as Founding President and CEO of Oceans Network Canada from 2007 to 2012. Prior to that, he was the University of Victoria's first VP Research from 1998 to 2007. A Fellow of the Kane Academy of Health Sciences, He's, he is the author of two books, and over 100 peer-reviewed publications in the field of environmental and community health. Lastly, Matthew Lucas joined the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, SHRC, in September 2015 as the Executive Director, Corporate Strategy and Performance, and as a background in the area of science, technology, and innovation policy. Prior to SHRC, Matthew worked at Industry Canada, where he held different positions, including Senior Policy Advisor to the Science, Technology and Innovation Council Secretariat and the Departmental Advisor to the Minister of State for Science and Technology. Matthew received his PhD from the University of Toronto. We look forward to hearing from our expert panelists and to your questions. Each panelist will start with a brief statement, followed by a discussion here on the podium. At about the 40 minute mark, we will turn to audience questions. So question to you, Kim. Kim, you are the scientific director and CEO of a pan-Canadian network that is supporting multi-regional research. How are you thinking about reproducibility and replicability in that context? Thanks for the question and thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's uh, really, um, uh, really look forward to the discussion today. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna start answering the question by putting up some slides here. Um, and then, uh, I'll just start before I get into the answer, um, just to give you a sense what I'm gonna to try to do. I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about my viewpoint, where I'm coming from and answering these questions. Um, 
a couple key definitions uh, and then talk about some of the challenges to reproducibility and replicability uh, in current, current and future directions. And I don't have any conflicts to declare in, in this talk. So my vantage, um, where I'm coming from, is uh, my training is at the intersection of health services and health policy, um, population health and health economics. So, uh, so I really come from this. Um, I care about the healthcare system and do a lot of research in that space, but really um, fundamentally think about health as, as much broader than that and work on the social determinants of health and structural determinants of health area as well. Health Data Research Network Canada, which... Uh, for which I am scientific director and CEO, is supporting multi-regional research that addresses health and health equity. And the multi-regional piece of that is really quite important to thinking about how we even contemplate um, reproducibility and repl replicability, because of course we know that in Canada, healthcare services and social services are delivered at the provincial and territorial level for the most part. And so we have a challenge of consistent and comparable data when they are coming from those routinely collected data systems. My focus has generally been on multiple data linkages and creative use of data. So not just using the fields that are there, but actually trying to extrapolate beyond those. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit because that, that actually has quite an important implication for reproducibility and replicability as well. Um, and of course, what we're studying are complex systems. So there's lots of variables that go into models. There's many relationships. Sometimes we don't have the right measure or the right data to get to a concept we're interested in. Um, there is a uh, context that's very important. And of course, in complex systems, one of the things that we think about is that they're dynamic. So there's changes in those complex systems over time. And all of that just leads to um, really um, the importance of analysis, but the importance of really sophisticated methods and um, conceptual clarity that, that go into the development of, of the data that would be used um, by those methods. So just a couple of things on definitions. This is the, the slide I actually quite like to talk about reproducibility and replicability. And really what this does is just a, maybe this is because I have training in epidemiology and everything boils down to a two by two table. Um, but this, this just really talks about whether you're talking about the same data or different data and whether using the same analysis or a different analysis. So when we're reproducing, it's can I or somebody um, else use the same data and same analysis that I used and get the same results. Replicability um, is when we then try to use um, different data, but the same approach. Um, and can we actually replicate some findings um, from a particular area? Uh, there's this addition of this idea of robustness where we use the same data, but a different analysis. You get the same answer if you actually take a different analytic approach and then generalizability, of course, when, when we actually can finally say something is not just true within the data that we looked at it, but seems to be true in different contexts as well. So we've got that sort of external um, validity and generalizability. The other thing I really um, focus on quite a lot, and so I wanted to provide a bit of uh, definition is this idea of emergent properties. So this is the idea of using data or developing variables that don't necessarily exist in the data that you have in your hand, but that can be um, used or created if we're really pushing the data as far as they can go. So the idea of an emergent property is it's a property of a system that it's that doesn't um, reduce to any individual component of that system. And so it's a feature of the system as a whole. And we can think like an emergent property in the natural world would be something like birds flying in some kind of formation where this is each individual bird is flying, but they end up in this formation because there's certain kinds of rules um, that they can follow instinctively about how fast they're flying, how far apart they are from another bird and, and that sort of thing. So that's an emergent property of a system of a flock of birds. And in the health space, and this is really focuses just on the healthcare system, but we can think about um, this more broadly as well. Emergent properties are often the things that we would think about measuring in terms of health system performance. So um, emergent properties of quality and safety and efficiency and efficacy, equity, and, and so on. And so th this, this is really what I'm quite interested in. Um, and it means that we're actually developing new kinds of conceptual understanding from routine data. And this, this is why it gets to the, this point of being really quite important for replicability, because it means that we're doing things that really need to ex be explained very carefully. Um, 
clearly written down either in code and or prose um, so that somebody else could actually pick up that work and, and try to do something similar. So I just go quickly through the ways within our network HDR in Canada that we're trying to respond, um, both identify the challenges here and then respond to those challenges. And, and maybe I should just underline that maybe, and it, maybe it's quite obvious from what I've said already, but the data that we're talking about are highly confidential and really can't be deposited into, into open data repositories because they don't belong to the, uh, the researcher. We don't do primary data collection when we're talking about routinely collected data, these data belong to health systems and social systems. They're governed in very particular ways. So other people can get access to the same data that we've used and we can um, provide um, clear ways of doing that, but they're not gonna be deposited into a place that you can just download freely and, and carry on merrily from that. So because we're talking about sensitive and private data, part of how we can respond to these challenges uh, is by really um, applying the FAIR principles so we can make data findable, accessible, interoperable, um, and reusable. And the FAIR principles, of course, uh, are about making sure that findable, as in you, you know what I've done, you know where you can get the data, they're accessible, not because you can download it, but, but there's a clear application process and, and some um, notion of how you would go about getting the same data set that I used in the study that I did, that sort of thing. The other important thing here, I think, is really clear metadata and analytic set um, analytic data set genealogy. And what what I mean by that is we usually don't use raw um, through the original data set when we're doing these kinds of analyses. You'll take and because we work in a linked data space, you'll take six or seven or eight or ten different data sets and link them together. And by definition, the analytic data set you create will be quite a bit. Um, distant from those original data forms. And so you really have to be able to trace that through and provide metadata that gives everybody a really clear um, notion or recipe for how you got from the original data to the data set that you're using in your analysis. So those things can go actually a very, very long way for both reproducibility and replicability. Um, I think that another, a, challenge that we've identified is that there's very limited space in journals for methods. I mean, journals like to see the statistical methods, um, but when we're talking about the process we go through on um, actually going from those complex linked data into an analytic data set and then add the layer of doing that for six or seven different jurisdictions in Canada for one um, study, where you're trying to harmonize data that have been generated in very different ways and processes and with different policy contexts and so on, it's really much too much to be able to think that you'd be able to put that into a methods um, section of a, a standard journal article where you're trying to talk about the results of your particular analysis. So what we've been trying to do is to develop guidelines and, uh, and publication venue and a publication attraction to actually write the methods paper, how you went about creating your harmonized data, how you went about going from the extant original data set to your analytic um, uh, data set. And again, this could be um, as, consider it like a deposit paper for the, the purpose of conceptual clarity and reproducibility and replicability. The concept dictionaries and related code repositories are also really clear examples of things that we can be doing to help all of this and just all in the name of transparency. Um, the, the transferability of code is another thing we've been thinking about. Um, so in, this is really thinking about how that um, local context and the local policy environment might alter our uh, understanding of both how we need to do the analysis and the generalizability of what we're doing. Um, and so if we think about that, that process uh, of making harmonized data, it's probably something we shouldn't be thinking about on a project by project basis. Uh, in, in fact, we probably can create some common data models or some similar approaches that kind of more get to the point where researchers have not starting from that raw data, but starting from a place where there's already been a lot of work into making those data um, consistent apples to apples comparisons across jurisdictions or even within a single jurisdiction over time. And if those are transparent and well-documented, like the common data model kind of idea, 
um, then uh, we can build on that with the analytic pieces. We've already put in place that space um, for replicability because you have a common data model. I hope that's clear. So um, that's what I wanted to say at, least, uh, say at least to start the conversation. I will stop there and um, hand it back. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Perfectly on time. Um, so thank you. Uh, now we're moving to Martin Taylor. Martin, the Canadian Research Data Center uh, Network, CRDCN, um, they are, which are the RDCs to which researcher can access confidential StatCan and other data, is a primary network for advanced quantitative analysis in the social and health sciences in Canada. How can researchers produce and convey strong evidence for research and policy when the data are secure and confidential? Thanks very much, Marie, and uh, thank you for this opportunity just to say a few words about the Canadian Research Data Centre Network in the context of thinking about replicability and reproducibility and transparency in the work that we do. Uh, just a few words then uh, at the outset about uh, the uh, Research Data Centre Network. Um, it's, it's best thought of in many ways as a bridge, I think, between two deep reservoirs. Uh, a reservoir of the uh, breadth and depth of the micro data that's available primarily through Statistics Canada, and the breadth and depth of the reservoir of over now 2,400 researchers who over 20 years now have been actively using these data. And I guess my main point uh, through this brief set of remarks is that the CRDCN, like the Health Data Research Network, uh, provides a fertile test bed uh, for examining uh, replicability, reproducibility uh, in the context of fair principles and uh, open data more generally. So just a reminder uh, that uh, our network, as I mentioned, is 20 years or 23 years old now, having first been established by the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council funding uh, back in 2000. Uh, it's now one of 19 uh, of Canada's major science initiatives, and thank you through you, Luke, uh, Matthew, to Shirk and CHR and CFI for that uh, major funding renewal that we've just experienced. As I say, we're supporting some 2,400 researchers across a broad range of disciplines through 33 secure data facilities. Uh, we're provide unique access to over 200 uh, data sets, both uh, survey data and administrative data. And as a consequence over these uh, 23 years of activity, uh, we've uh, assembled now uh, a very substantial uh, bibliography of over 5,000 publications of various sorts. And what I'll reference in a moment is how, of course, uh, replicability in particular uh, has been uh, a key and cardinal feature of that work. It goes without saying uh, that we're in the business of providing strong evidence, even within the constraints that are imposed by our use of confidential and secure micro data. And it's obvious that that's essential for both advancing research in the academic uh, quarters, as well as then, as uh, Kim's group is doing, informing key areas of public policy. Uh, in our case, uh, those range over such areas as income and employment, uh, immigration and settlement, uh, education and social development, uh, health, population health and health services, and a number of cross-cutting themes beyond those. That begs the question, of course, of what are the criteria for evaluating the strength of the evidence that we're providing through our research and thereby seeking to inform public policy? And where does reproducibility and replicability fit within those strength of evidence criteria? Like Kim, I've had the advantage at McMaster in my earlier life uh, as an academic of being strongly exposed to epidemiology uh, because of my own research foci. And as you know, there are various schema uh, in the literature uh, that point us to strength of evidence criteria. Bradford Hill's work back in the 70s is a good case in point with a variety of criteria that speak to both strength of inference and thereby strength of evidence. Uh, here are a number of the criteria that are particularly relevant, I think, in the context of the work we're thinking about, and notice how replicability and reproducibility uh, is key within that list uh, of those kinds of criteria. 
And I don't need to pause here, I don't think, because uh, Kim in a different two by two table uh, has demonstrated exactly what this is saying, namely uh, drawing particularly on Peng's work, I think back in the 20, 2011, uh, the distinctions to be drawn between replicability, reproducibility and robustness. So I won't uh, repeat what uh, Kim has so uh, clearly already uh, stated in that regard. So how is it then uh, that this network, the Canadian Research Data Centre network, is a fertile testbed for producing strong evidence? Well, just let's think about some of the key characteristics of the network. It provides unique access to the survey and administrative microdata. So by definition then, of course, we're dealing with de-identified individual records. And that takes us away from the intrinsic frailties and vagaries of aggregate data and the various uh, inferential flaws and fallacies that can arise as a consequence. But it's not only the fact that these are individual records taking us back then to the microdata themselves, it's the breadth and depth of that Canadian data repository, the hundreds of files that we're able to provide access to. And not only that, uh, the fact that a number of these surveys linked to administrative data are longitudinal surveys. So they afford the opportunity for time series analyses, which is a key part also, obviously, of our ability to do re replication work in particular. And the fact that these are linked data files in many instances, and Kim again has referenced this in the the complexity of the questions we're trying to address and therefore the need to be able to link data uh, is another crucial advantage that the CRDCN data uh, provide. But of course that's only one side of the equation. The other of course is the expertise of the researchers themselves uh, and their commitment uh, and their ability to advance research and to adopt then uh, principles that obviously are central to what we're talking about today. That said, there are challenges. There's no question about that. And these are legitimate challenges. These are secure and confidential uh, data governed by the Federal Statistics Act. And as a consequence, then there have to be uh, accreditation requirements for institutional and researcher access to use those data. They're not just open season. That said, let's not overstate how restrictive those access criteria are when you consider that there are now 42 partner and affiliate universities across the country who have access to these data through the network. And as I said earlier, over 2,400 researchers. So uh, as significant as these uh, accreditation access criteria are, obviously as a lot of people uh, and a lot of expertise that's nevertheless uh, taking advantage of this opportunity. There are some restrictions on reusing code in a number of ways that Kim has already alluded to. Uh, and these are ones that clearly uh, we are seeking to address very directly uh, to reduce those restrictions and therefore enable replicability and reproducibility analyses. Arguably, I think, and I'll come to this in just a moment, uh, what we are supporting in terms of the work that uh, the network is involved in is best suited probably to assess replication and robustness and extending previous studies. As I'll mention, uh, reproducibility is even more of a challenge. The institutional context, and I'm not going to take much time here because time is short, and uh, I'm sure Matthew is going to speak to this in any case. Uh, there's a larger context within which all of this situates, particularly in our case, because of our strong partnership with Statistics Canada is the federal data strategy, the Tri-Council Research Data Management Policy Guidelines, obviously, and as again, Kim has mentioned already, the FAIR principles. In that context, I think it is important to underline the fact that the CRDCN over many years now has had this unique partnership with Statistics Canada codified in a memorandum of understanding and a joint commitment to optimize data use for the public good. Uh, so this is written in essentially to our raison d'etre, our mandate and our mission. The Tri-Council uh, policy guidelines, Matthew will talk to these, but they do include provisions for restricted access and recognizing the, the, the necessity of restricted access to confidential and secure data. 
On the other hand, uh, the important point here, I think, to underscore is that research data management standards, basic standards, are guaranteed to a very significant extent for CRDCN researchers by reason of the ways in which these data are collected, stored and curated uh, in advance of their use and accessibility uh, through uh, the network. And then if we go to the FAIR principles, are the data findable in the sense we understand it? Yes, within the limits of made the data disclosure. Are they accessible? Yes, within, with certain requirements and restrictions that I've referenced. Are they interoperable? Yes, to some degree within limits of data ownership and code sharing. Are they reusable? Yes, again, within certain limits of access to archive files. And I don't want to uh, minimize uh, some of those uh, qualifiers, but nevertheless, uh, we, we can check some significant boxes here. What about reproducibility specifically then? Well, in principle, prior analyses are reproducible if past, a past researcher discloses details about their data set, their code and their software, but that's more by the exception than the rule. And I think Kim, you've already referenced uh, that being a challenge for us. In practice, as a consequence, uh, reproducibility is rarely, if ever done, because of lack of availability and access to essential details around uh, how variables have been coded, used, uh, what analytical procedures have necessarily been followed in the detail that would be necessary to understand. Plus, uh, within uh, the, the network, at least as it stands at the moment, and I think this can be addressed, is that uh, to in fact do a reproducible study requires in essence a new research proposal. Uh, so it can't be that you just take something that's already been approved and reproduce it. Uh, it, it stands as a new study altogether. And again, uh, Kim's referenced this, that to some degree one can argue that there have been historically, maybe less so currently, uh, disincentives at least in the social science community, uh, by reason of journal policies and maybe even university policies with regard to recognizing the importance of this kind of work and giving space for it in publications and recognition for it in terms of peer review uh, within the university context for career progress and merit and whatever. As a consequence, a bottom line here, uh, and I stand to be corrected, but I don't see, uh, and my co-workers here uh, show no related entries in the CRDCN bibliography, as big as it is, that would qualify as truly reproducible uh, studies, uh, or reproducibility studies in the way that we would understand it. On the other hand, replicability, uh, the uh, history is replete with many examples. Uh, whether they are replications and extensions of previous studies uh, or otherwise. So journals here do encourage extensions, no question. And the CRDC and bibliography is a good resource for finding work that's previously uh, been conducted using the same or similar data. A good example uh, that we often quote is the self-sufficiency project analysis by Riddells, by the Riddells, uh, first published in 2014 and then revisited in a 2020 paper uh, in the Journal of Labor Economics. And this was a replication study incorporating information about impacts of changes uh, in policies on incentives to leave welfare and return to the workforce, where the later study are, are overturned many findings of the initial study. And the other point I want to make here is that in our recent international peer review that was part of our federal funding renewal application, the International Peer Review Panel singled out the scientific excellence of the work that we have produced over the years, not simply for me to boast about it, but rather because uh, a significant piece of the strength of that and the scientific excellence of that work was seen to be the way in which uh, later studies had built on earlier studies. Uh, to advance the research by reason of the fact that replicability work was possible. All of that said, uh, there's a lot of work still to be done, uh, as again Kim has indicated in her own context. Yes, the CRDCN is certainly a fertile testbed for replicability and reproducibility studies, but there are certainly significant ways forward to enhance opportunities. 
the creation of structural files to check co-consistency without requiring necessarily the clearance that currently is required to do that. Updates to metadata and public facing documentation using software like Collectica, for example. Very importantly for us uh, is the implementation of remote access to data, which we see as a avenue to growth in terms of not only ease of access to the data themselves, but also bringing new researchers into the system. And then uh, as part of that same transition, uh, centralized access to data and software, which will enable, I think, us particularly as a central staff team to be more gen proactively involved in uh, enhancing and advancing a number of the ways in which uh, these opportunities for replicability studies and possibly reproducibility studies can be uh, uh, advanced. And then finally, uh, CRDCN initiatives that are specific to uh, advancing activity here. We've had a committee on replicability and reproducibility. Uh, we are now developing relevant training related to these issues within secure data environments. Uh, there was a replication workshop in 2022, which included an RDC component. And all of that to say that we are in the business of incentivizing and enabling a research culture to engage in this type of analysis. So with that, uh, Marie, thank you. Uh, I will end there and in so doing acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Grant Gibson, our assistant uh, research program director who's uh, worked closely with me as we have thought through some of uh, these issues as they apply to uh, our network. So Marie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for those comments. So now it's time for Matthew Lucas. Uh, Matthew. Canada's research funding agencies adopted a research data management policy in 2021 to strengthen research excellence. So my question is, where are we at in the implementation of that policy? And considering that it is not an open data policy, how does it contribute to promoting reproducible research practices? Thanks for the uh, question, Marie, and thanks to you and Lars for the invitation to take part today. Really pleased to be sharing the virtual stage as it is with Kimberly and, and Martin to be given the chance to talk and think more deeply around how our policy has some implications for reproducibility. I'm just gonna share my slides here. There, hopefully you're seeing the full slide version now. So in thinking about this talk, I thought I would start by taking us back to the objective of the policy uh, when we started the development of it back in 2017. And I should say at the start, although I'm clearly talking to a social science community today, this policy has been developed and is being implemented in very, very close collaboration with our colleagues, uh, my colleagues at NSERC and CIHR. We meet monthly on open science issues. Uh, and, and issues such as reproducibility to understand the implications for our policy and how to continue to evolve our policy moving forward. But if we look back to 2017, we can see uh, a number of uh, sort of the vision that was expressed at the time uh, that research data management be accepted as a key component of research excellence. So not, not something extrinsic to the way we carry out research, but something a part of the very nature of research, the research methodology itself. The researchers are equipped and, and ready to engage in international research collaboration. Uh, I'll speak in a moment about the, the evolution of uh, research data management policies around the world that have implications for our researchers and, 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 and stress the need that for our researchers to be well equipped, trained uh, to, uh, to collaborate effectively and live up to some of the requirements that other agencies have. The Canadian research institutions are ready to support RDM. You'll see a key component of our policy has been to place a, a significant responsibility on, on universities and research hospitals to play a very important role in supporting research data management. The increased ability for data to be archived, discovered, and where appropriately reused. And of course, the overall desire that more Canadian data sets are recognized uh, and data is shared. You'll notice that nowhere in that vision at the time are the words reproducibility mentioned, but if you think about the future that we envision here, it is a future that sets us well uh, on the path to, uh, to enabling, to facilitating uh, reproducible, uh, reproducibility and verification uh, of the research that, that, that we as agencies fund. I won't uh, belabor this slide just to say clearly there has been a, an evolution of policies around the world. 
were related to data management, related to open data. Uh, the uh, very significant one announced in um, uh, last August, the memo from the Office of Science Technology Policy in the White House, indicating both a eventual move to immediate open access, but also a move to open data uh, needed to verify uh, research results. So a lot of conversations going on right now about what this means both in the American context and what it means for agencies such as the granting agencies in Canada that collaborate very extensively with our, our US counterparts. So we were very pleased to have finally launch the policy in March 2021. 20, uh, uh, we had been ready to launch it a year earlier and we all know what, uh, what happened at that point that set us uh, delayed us a little bit, uh, but it did allow us, I think, time to reflect uh, on, on some of the um, the elements of the policy that maybe needed a little bit of massaging um, and, and the effective timelines for, for, for implementing that policy. So there are three components to the policy, as you know. One, the first component of institutional strategy. So this was that post-secondary institutions and research hospitals that administer granting agency funds need to develop and publicly post a strategy to support research data management. This is a unique element of our policy not found in many other policies around the world that I'll speak a bit more about in a moment. Uh, secondly, that uh, data management plans uh, will be incorporated into the applications of certain funding opportunities. Uh, and we mentioned we would, we would announce that in the spring of of 2022, which we did, and we're at CHIRC at least, we're now incorporating that into stage two of our current partnership grant competition, and we'll take some lessons learned and plan to expand that requirement um, uh, moving forward. And then finally, the third component of data deposit, which is very clearly linked to the issue of reproducibility, that uh, grant recipients deposit the uh, digital data uh, and code uh, related to the final research outputs in a trusted repository. And we didn't set a timeline for when that requirement would come into effect, knowing that uh, the ecosystem was still evolving at the time. The Digital Research Alliance of Canada had not yet been fully put in, in place. Um, and the, the, the structures weren't necessarily there to support this requirement. Um, but we feel now is the time that we're gonna start, we're ready to start consultations and engagement to, uh, to talk more broadly across the community about how to bring that into effect. So just thinking, first of all, about the institutional strategy element and why did we include this in our policy? First of all, the recognition that the agencies are only one of a number of players. Uh, uh, research institutions are a key supporter of research data management, a key supporter of all elements of the, the research process uh, and the data management process related to that, um, whether it's you know, downstream in terms of the data deposit, whether it's supporting with the computing resources needed, whether it's providing training to their students or staff, uh, whether it's providing platforms and tools, institutions, while not providing all of that, are a key player in bringing that to, together. Also to encourage alignment and collaboration both within institutions and across institutions. When we consulted on the policy, we intentionally brought together people from the CIO's office, from the library office, from the research uh, office and the ethics boards to have a conversation about what data management meant in their different contexts and how to bring those together. And what we've heard that the process of developing these strategies uh, did uh, bring those different pieces together more effectively across institutions. But we also wanted the publication of those strategies to be a source of information that would help us identify where further opportunities to collaborate across organizations exist and where further uh, gaps exist. So in a sense to provide a snapshot of the existing capacity across the broad system and where not only the agencies but other important stakeholders uh, have a role to play in, in filling those gaps. Why the requirement for data management plans? And perhaps this doesn't need to be belabored with, uh, with this audience, uh, but a, a growing indication, a, a important part of just data intensive research. The, the policy itself was a recognition that the research uh, ecosystem was evolving. And while clearly some disciplines have been data intensive for many, many years, um, some others were, were, were moving in that direction, both in terms of the sources of information they were using, but the tools, the analytical tools they were starting to use to analyze their data. And so they needed to think more deeply about what data management meant for them. Um, and we, we actually ran some, uh, some pilot projects in which we asked grant holders at Shirk at least after they'd 
receive their grants to do data management plans. And the overwhelming response, we brought them together in a workshop, the response was that this really helped them to think about different parts of their research in a more holistic way. Issues they had addressed before, but never, never in a, in a, in a holistic uh, fashion. And overall, the responses they felt that made their research more robust and made their research more effective. Um, but we also recognize DMPs and institutional strategies are intended to be living documents. This is not a static environment, to say the least. Things are evolving rapidly. And so um, both within the context of a given research project, but also in the context of the types of supports that an institution is providing, we know those will evolve and change uh, uh, over time. And we also know there's not a one size fits all uh, approach that makes any sense. And so we, um, we are really leaving it up to the community to essentially determine what are the effective supports that institutions need to provide and what does effective data management mean in the context of any given discipline? Uh, a question that could be uh, pushed to the issue of reproducibility too, uh, which I won't discuss in detail today, but you can imagine across the breadth of the humanities and social sciences in particular, the issue of what does reproducibility um, mean is something we really need to look to the disciplines to help uh, help think through, and then 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 work with the agencies to help understand what our role can be to uh, to support that. Data deposit, the final element uh, of our policy, uh, of course, the need to ensure secure data preservation, the need to make data accessible uh, if if appropriate. Our policy, if you if you've had a look at it, strongly supports open data, strongly supports data sharing, but we recognize there are many. Uh, 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 times when data may not be shared, issues we've already discussed around data, data sensitivity, data privacy, issues around uh, indigenous data sovereignty, commercial questions. So we recognize there are reasons why data cannot be shared. The policy is not an open data policy. It does not require um, um, uh, data to be open or to be shared. Uh, but we do recognize it's an important tool to advance issues such as reproducibility. So as we're thinking through and consulting on this final component of the data of, of the policy, the data deposit policy, we we are starting to think through whether there might be some adjustments to our policy needed to ensure that even if the data itself is not open, enough information is provided so um, uh, to uh, to support reproducibility, to support findability, to support, to support um, researchers trying to understand the approach taken, uh, taken by their, uh, their colleagues. And so, as I mentioned, um, uh, whereas we're, we're, we're phasing this in, the, since we launched consultations on this policy, uh, the issue of the FAIR principles has been brought up a couple of times today, has gained much more prevalence within the broader research community. Our policy stresses the need to have fair data, but we recognize there might be a bit of a tension here between fair data and a policy that doesn't actually require data and currently doesn't require that the metadata uh, be open. So one of the things we're thinking through is whether we need to adjust the policy and think about what metadata might need to be made publicly available and how that might be, uh, might be framed. Um, and we expect to be, uh, announcing shortly some of the work that will help us think through these issues and really invite feedback from, from the economics community, from the, 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 the broad community across all disciplines to help us think through what that means. And, and, and in the context of sensitive data and confidential data is another one that we're trying to think through how do we verify the trustability of deposit repositories for the depositing of sensitive data. And I know uh, groups such as the Data uh, Alliance of Canada is thinking through this and has work, working groups uh, looking to address this. Um, um, and while the challenges are not simple by any means, uh, we are confident that we will be able to find, find solutions moving forward. So as I mentioned, thinking about requiring the openness of metadata uh, and, and how do we address the interoperability issue across a wide range of disciplines, monitoring and compliance, um, both from the agency's point of view, but also allowing researchers to monitor, and I, maybe I shouldn't use the word monitor here, but to know what data is available, what their colleagues are doing and are, are sharing. And so we're, we've actually been part of conversations around a, a national PID strategy, so a national strategy to embed persistent identifiers in some elements of research, whether that's publications or data sets, um, um, to allow uh, data to be found and linked um, together. Uh, responsible research assessment. The, this also 
affects the way we think about how we both assess research and assess applications for uh, for research. And so we're thinking through at the agencies across all three agencies working together on this, how we need to perhaps rethink some elements of the assessment process to take into account um, uh, how well, definitely how data is is managed and how data is shared and also to encourage some of the culture shift that's required in some disciplines, by all means, not all disciplines, to um, encourage openness where, wherever uh, ever possible. And to help our thinking, we're really pleased to have recently joined the Research on Research Initiative, um, which is uh, an initiative run out of the UK with a number of international partners looking at how funding agencies support uh, research and, and, and elements of the broader research ecosystem that we need to think about differently. And so reproducibility is definitely on the agenda. Shirk and CIHR are both uh, partners of this, of this institute now. We're collaborating closely with, um, with NSERC on this as well. And we were pleased to be participating in the Metascience Conference recently in, in Washington, DC, where I was really pleased to meet Lars for the first time. Um, and where the conversation around reproducibility and recordability uh, was very much on the agenda. And we're hoping actually perhaps to bring some of these discussions in a, in a higher level to Canada as well in the near future. So stay, stay tuned for, um, for that. Some resources that we at the agencies have put into place here, we at Shirk have developed some connection grants. Um, please look at our website and it, it, is, it is disciplinary agnostic. We just want to support uh, disciplines or institutions that are thinking about data management and certainly reproducibility in the context of data management is something that could be considered here. Uh, and there's a number of other um, um, uh, tools that the agencies have produced. Uh, you can find all of this on our website, although also help be happy to answer any questions about that. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Very interesting. Um, and very interesting from, from all of you. I'd like to thank all the panelists for your thought provoking and interesting material. So I will now open up the webinar to questions. So please enter any further questions you have in the Q&A. We uh, welcome further queries to a particular panelist or just broader questions directed to one or more panelists. Lars will be monitoring uh, the Q&A for questions. And um, I believe we have one to start. It is from, uh, from Mike Veal to Kim, um, perhaps others also if uh, you have uh, thoughts on this. Um, so the first question is, would you have advice for journals that may face the situation where data ownership issues may hamper reproducibility. As you may know, uh, Mike Veal is the editor of the Canadian Public Policy. Yeah, indeed. Uh, thanks for the question, Mike. Um, <clears throat> so I'll say a few things about this, and I'm, I, I, but I'll start by saying I'm, I'm not going to touch on anything related to Indigenous data sovereignty because I think that's just a completely um, different set of considerations given um, indigenous data ownership and um, different requirements for governance of those data uh, in that, those circumstances. Um, I do think that we're, from a journal perspective, where researchers can't deposit or provide data um, for purposes of reproducibility, they can provide information on how to request those data. So in, in my organization, uh, Population Data BC, where you can request um, link data from that represent routinely collected data and other data sources from the province and from federal governments and so on. Um, we do have an archiving policy. So when I have a data request and I'm finished with my research, it, it, the data are archived. So somebody came along and said, I would like to request the McGrail Project X um, to try to reproduce that. The, the, they're there, they're, they're available. Um, at the same time, I think we have to understand that there is additional cost to this because there would be a process for making a request to um, venture forward and reproducibility. And because the data are complex to work with and the genealogy I talked about before, there's a there's a cost for the analytic process. So it's not really as simple as running a model. Not even that wouldn't necessarily be simple, but they'd probably be, if you were thinking about reproducibility, you'd probably want to be going back to the starting point and checking all of the um, kind of decisions that are made in the data management um, process. So there's, I think that there has to be consideration from journals about the cost of that. 
I'm also going to say, I just really wonder if there isn't a peer review role in all of this. And I'm thinking about the sort of reproducibility crisis that we've been talking about in the academic literature for some time. And I just, I wonder sometimes how much that might be prevented with better peer review, more attention to methods, more expectation that people are transparent um, with how they put their data sets together, maybe greater space for appendices in some cases to to provide that detail um, so that peer reviewers have a chance to really interrogate, not just did you use the right statistical model, but actually did you, were you conceptually clearer in how you were using your data and how you put them together to begin with? So I, I think there's a number of things that can be done, but none of it is entirely simple or straightforward. Thank you, Kim. Um, Martin, Ma Matthew, do you want to, do you have something to say or else I will we'll keep asking questions? Well, maybe, well, maybe I, I could, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead Matthew. No, you go, you go first. I was just going to say, I mean, part of this is the recognition that data management does require resources. Um, and we at the agencies recognize that and it is an eligible expense. Um, I, I, I know that creates other challenges. It's not that our pool of funding is necessarily grown to account for that, but certainly within the context of an individual application, we recognize that effective data management um, um, costs time and, and energy to, uh, to manage. And, but it is the hope of the, the, the it's the hope that the, the, the disciplinary um, uh, communities that guide what is acceptable research and how research should be managed will also develop um, protocols and, and, and under, understood guidelines around the accepted, accepted management um, and state of the data, which will allow sharing for issues such as reprodu reproducibility down the road. We don't pretend that this is gonna happen quickly. Um, and in some disciplines, it, it may take a significant long time, but it's gonna be the, in a sense, the joint, I say pressure, but the, the encouragement of the agency, the encouragement of peers, the encouragement of institutions to ensure that when one has data sets that, that they are basing their research on, those data sets are in such a state that they can be effectively shared and communicated with, uh, with others. I, I guess the, the footnote I would add to Kim's comment um, is to some extent, we're talking about a culture shift uh, within the social science community. And Kim, I think you put your finger on it in one of your slides uh, when you talked about the complexity of the problems uh, that we are seeking to address and therefore the complexity of the analyses that we conduct as a consequence. A danger of that is that to a certain extent, we use the complexity as an excuse for saying that we can't reproduce or replicate uh, previous research. It's just too complicated. Then you think about the cultures within the experimental communities, within the natural sciences or indeed within the health sciences, where frankly, replication and reproducibility is the being without which nothing else for strong evidence. Because of particularly if we think about the health science community, the risks of false negatives and false positives, whether that be in diagnostic research or intervention research or whatever. And I do think that we have to start to move a little closer to our understanding of why these issues matter in terms of ultimately what we're trying to produce, which I guess goes back to my strong evidence argument, whether it's in the context of advancing knowledge or in terms of informing policy, um, because we use language very loosely, right? Uh, we talk in the federal context or provincial context about evidence-based policy, but what we really want to talk about is a strong evidence-based policy, and therefore, what are the criteria that have to be satisfied in order for the evidence to be strong? And that's a culture shift to some degree. And as you point out, I think it's one that then has to be reflected in peer review and it has to be reflected in journal acceptability. Uh, I would argue in peer review uh, within our universities, et cetera. So, uh, you know, from a vice president research point of view, uh, Marie, a uh, position you're in and I was in previously, I mean, these are issues that are as much institutional uh, as they are uh, specific to the researcher. And there, 
Matthew, is where the councils have a very key role to play. Um, I think, Kim, you and I are advantaged in terms of working with networks uh, where we're dealing with data that are uh, secondary data uh, that have already been to some degree significantly create, curated uh, and managed in ways that are perhaps advantageous or potentially advantageous to achieving the ends we're trying to achieve. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I would argue that we are talking about a significant culture shift, particularly within the social science community. Mm -hmm. I have a, I, I, we have a follow up question for, for Matthew. Um, so in terms of funding, does that mean that the creator of the data needs to fund future access? Or is that something that SHRC also fund um, future access costs? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. And I don't have a great answer for you at this time. Um, one of the questions will be, how do the different parts of the system learn to play well together? So that's one of the questions. We're working very close with the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, for example, but other players as well that have um, storage responsibilities that have curation responsibilities. A question inevitably comes up and will need to be sorted out. Where do the responsibilities for the costs associated with those, act those activities lie? And as a granting agency that funds, you know, five year, maybe seven year projects at the most, well, that the value of that data doesn't necessarily end. And so how do we support the ongoing preservation? And also how do we figure out which data should be preserved because not necessarily all data is, is good data. So I don't pretend all of these questions have been, um, the answers to these questions have yet yet, yet, yet to, be, to be sorted out, but we are thinking, thinking through them. Yeah, thanks. Um, now a question for Martin. Um, you mentioned that uh, one thing that uh, discouraged uh, reproducibility was that a reproducibility study needed a new uh, approval, a new data access approval. Mm -hmm. So um, this seems to me uh, that there would be scope for streamlining uh, because the, or the original study was approved. And so yep. there sh seems like there should be a way to, to work within that to ask for a special access only for the purposes of, of uh, reproducing uh, exactly, exactly, so. exactly that. And, and, and as you know, Marie, uh, you're sufficiently familiar with uh, the network uh, to know that there are ongoing discussions with Statistics Canada, especially with regard to what are legitimate and reasonable uh, requirements as opposed to those that go beyond. And, and let me use that point to, to, to make a little bit of a segue because, uh, and again, uh, Matthew, you alluded to this, what's happening in the international community? Um, and in what, what lessons can and should uh, Canadian uh, agencies, particularly in our case, Statistics Canada, uh, working with us and with our universities, learn from that international community in terms of best practice, uh, or better practice, perhaps, uh, more rightly stated. Um, and as we know, uh, jurisdictions vary uh, significantly in terms of how they've dealt with a number of the issues around handling secure and confidential data. And so learning lessons uh, as to what is reasonable in striking the balance between what I often describe as the stewardship of data, which is ideal, and the guardianship of data, which is arguably a little less ideal. Uh, where do you strike the balance? Um, and how is that balance being struck uh, by other jurisdictions from whom we can and should be learning and indeed sharing? I know the argument is made that sometimes these are apples and oranges comparisons and uh, the one size doesn't fit all. But nevertheless, I think increasingly engaging, as Matthew, you've alluded to, that international community is a key part of advance. Kim, I don't know whether you have any comments to make on that from a health uh, analysis or research point of view. Just to agree with, with what you said, particularly around um, guardianship versus stewardship of, of information, but also just thinking about in the international context, better better attention to um, our ability to replicate and reproduce scientific um, studies within Canada naturally lends itself to then being able to collaborate 
or yes. reproduce and replicate internationally. So there's there's a very strong connection there. Yep, absolutely. If I could just add this, this issue came up at a Canadian Association of Research um, that I was at uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I know we have some further conversations we need to have, which are responsible conduct of research secretariat to ensure that the guidelines around research ethics are aligned with the guidelines around data deposit, for example, and the ability of, 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 of data sharing. And we have consulted extensively with that uh, group and community along the development of this policy, but there, I, I know there are further conversations we need to have. Okay. So I'd like now to go back to something that Kim mentioned very early on. Um, so the deposit papers, uh, in information about methodology or data processing, um, and how is that working in the discipline? And, and, and I guess it ties back to what Martin was saying about uh, incentivizing or recognizing the time spent uh, doing work that is not directly publishing a paper, but it is uh, putting uh, out there material that is related to that paper. So I can describe for you briefly what we're trying to work through uh, a process for this. So one of the one of these things is wh what you just said is we want to really create a recognition um, ability for researchers to encourage them to spend time on doing things that will help reproducibility, replicability, but frankly, just helps with transparency too. So people can actually see what you did and how you did it. It also helps to make sure that we're not making everybody start at the bottom of the learning curve every time they do a project. We need to stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us. And so what we started is a conversation with the group that, um, develop the record statement. The record statement is one of the part of the strobe um, sort of reporting guidelines and it and it's specifically oriented to um, routinely collected or secondary data. And so the question is whether there's a possibility of creating a bit of an extension to that so that that record statement can actually be more attuned to the things uh, the the format and expectations of a paper that would be a, a, a paper that identifies a, a methodology in this area. And the, the reasons for that are a couple. One is to encourage people to put things in peer review journals so that we can pull them then into, into um, exit, uh, inventories for um, validated concepts and things that have, have met a peer review standard. And so the second is to actually be able to apply the peer review, but to help the reviewers to understand what to expect and how to determine that a paper has sufficient quality and would be acceptable and deserves to be in that peer reviewed literature. So it's a, there's a lot to all of that. And there's a, a lot of complexity and the ability to judge something you haven't done yourself, but it's, that's the, that's the road we're at least exploring right now as a way to address all of that. And linked to that, Kim, I think, to, to, to go back to the question of who pays, uh, both in terms of resources, uh, in terms of capacity of staff uh, and the funds that are required, you know, that's where those of us who are leading central agencies or central networks, I would say, uh, have a very significant role to play potentially uh, in the sense that we are in a position, and it is a privileged position, certainly CRDCN is in a privileged position, of drawing operating funding from federal agencies uh, to support significant training activities uh, that are to some degree related to what we're talking about. Um, and so it does not have to necessarily depend entirely on the individual researcher or their institution uh, to take the initiative, but that these central uh, networks funded for some significant amount towards these ends uh, has a critical role to play. Um, and so, again, I think it's an evolution and it's a maturing of our research ecosystem in Canada. And I think the agencies, uh, SHRC, CHR, NSERC and CFI all have a key role to play in that. And that's where you know, the initiative, like the Major Science Initiatives Programme, is, is a key piece of providing funding that otherwise wouldn't be available. Uh, to resource some of these activities and central staff to assist researchers uh, to develop uh, these kinds of uh, approaches to considering stronger evidence, reproducibility, replicability, et cetera. So 
uh, th there is, I think, a, ch a, ch a change occurring slowly, but importantly, um, and HDRN, of course, is part of that as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to change it a little bit uh, and go to Matthew now. And uh, sort of a straightforward question, but how is the RDM strategy or policy monitored? So, for instance, how do you verify that preprints have data and code deposits associated with it? And is that something that the institution, the universities uh, have to do? Or is that something that is done uh, as part of the grant management process, whether yearly or, or, or at the final report stage? Uh, uh, one of the reasons we didn't put a timeline on the implementation of that third requirement, because we still need to figure that element out. Um, so, but first of all, we're not expecting the institutions to uh, monitor um, the data deposit requirement. Uh, we do at the agency, well, each of the agency manages sort of year end of grant reporting in a slightly different way. And there's some other work, we can have a whole conversation about how to do that better. Um, but so we do capture some of this information in what at Shirk we call an achievement report. But that's a very static report at this time, a one sh snapshot in time report. And I think we need to think I have another, I have a performance team looking more broadly at how we can capture some of this information on a more ongoing uh, basis. But part of the ability to capture this, I think also um, will be, will be supported by the development, as I mentioned, of sort of a national strategy around persistent identifiers where we can scrape, can gather some of that information rather than just relying on individuals to, um, uh, to provide it uh, to us in a rather, in a rather static way. Now that, requires a number of things, perhaps that we enforce a little more rigorously, the need to recognize, in this case, Shirk as a funder, uh, put down um, grant numbers uh, and, and the like. And so that does also involve some of the culture change that we've already been, um, been talking about, but there's both the policy elements, the internal capacity of the agency to collect and use this information, but also the broader uh, 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 ecosystem changes, I think that will allow us to have a, have a better sense moving forward, not only of what data sets are being created, because part of this policy is also to recognize the value in those data sets and the need to use those data sets, but also to, to monitor the, the compliance with our policy. Actually, that, that would lead uh, to a question for, for, for Martin. So uh, here we've mentioned a new data sets that are created. So uh, Obviously, we uh, 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 there's a research data management for the source data, but what about for the data that is that is generated or that is combined in novel ways by the researchers? So what uh, it's so it's not necessarily generated by StatCan, but it's using the StatCan data as one part of the analysis. What do you uh, view the, the 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 role of the CRDCN, for example, in 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 helping in that? And you're absolutely right, and and uh, that's an area where clearly uh, it's a work very much in early progress. I think in terms of then uh, providing uh, guidance as to how I'll call it those secondary uh, metadata uh, information is is uh, stored, created, and shared. Um, and uh, again, it goes to some of the training initiatives that uh, are in uh, in process with us uh, to enable that kind of understanding to develop across the system. So, uh, yes, uh, it isn't just, as you say, the original data and it, how it is managed, create, curated and uh, uh, coded, uh, but how then obviously it is uh, used uh, in particular analyses, particularly uh, as is often the case uh, in linked data uh, situations um, where the complexities are increased. So developing obviously a mentality uh, and providing training guidelines through us uh, that enable people to understand why a, it's important to do that and then to share it. And this is where I think uh, building uh, the, the new network uh, with more centralized uh, access to data and more centralized uh, services uh, being provided through the network over these next several years of our funding becomes a critical part of enabling uh, those initiatives to, uh, to advance. So thanks, Marie. Thank you. And Kim, perhaps you have also something to add to this uh, with the uh, new data created part. 
Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think it would be very similar to what Martin said. It's what, and what it was really what I was trying to refer to with that data genealogy kind of thing is you, you start with, you start with something, but by the time you get to the point where you're ready to run your actual analysis, it looks very, very different. And, and when I'm teaching about the use of routinely collected data, I, I start the class by telling people, even if you never intend to be an analyst yourself, you have to understand the hundreds of decisions that analysts are making on your behalf when they're helping you prep your data, particularly when we're talking about moving from a situation of service encounter, um, for example, into something that really aggregates that up and summarizes it is, is in, a, in a way that makes it, a, it able, um, ready for you to analyze. So just the there's and those steps are hidden if we don't do the kind of documentation that we've been talking about here. It's really really important. Uh, and the other thing I always say to students is, even if you think you have spent so much time and you understand this so well, six months from now you wouldn't be able to replicate your own study if you don't document it well. That's just the reality of it. That's very true. Okay, well, with that, um, I would like to thank you all for attending the Crest webinar uh, at the Kane Economics Association annual meetings. Reproducibility, confidentiality, and open data mandates. And I want to thank our speakers, Kimberly McGrail, Martin Taylor, and Matthew Lucas for presenting, and our audience members for uh, attending and asking questions. Our next session will be on June 27th, 2023, and it's the last one for this academic year. It'll be over Zoom at the regular time of 4.15 Eastern time. And the topic next time is the integration of reproducibility into social science graduate education. Mm -hmm. Register, uh, as always, on the website. You can find the, uh, the address in the chat. And uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.